<laughs> would like to welcome you to Word of Faith Radio. I apologize, we were experiencing some technical difficulties there as we were getting started off. Uh, I would like to thank you for tuning in. Now, Word of Faith Radio is a media outreach of Brent Whetstone Ministries. If you have not done so yet, be sure to like us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Brent W. Min, or go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Brent Whetstone. As always, you can visit us on the web and take advantage of all of our resources for free by visiting brentw.org. Now, last week we were kicking off our series, The Kingdom of the Cults, with talking about Scientology. And uh, today we were supposed to look into the Jehovah's Witnesses, but some interesting things happened last week with Scientology. And so we are actually going to continue on this entire month with looking into the Church of Scientology. Now, if you're following us on Facebook, you were able to keep up with what happened. But as you know, I broadcast on Saturdays from 1030 to 11, and um, my show is then published to the internet. Well, Monday, when I got home from work, it was perfectly timed that I had some special guests pull in the driveway right behind me, and those special guests just happened to be from the Buffalo Organization of the Church of Scientology, and none other than Blanca Brusette, Executive Director and OT8, OT Ambassador from Buffalo, was standing in my driveway so I had a nice visit from the Church of Scientology on Monday to kick off my week. Now, um, I recommend never letting Scientology come into your house. And I, I, I didn't let them come into my house. I actually took them out to Starbucks. I went to the most public Starbucks that I could find and uh, sat down and had a nice little chat with Blanca and her, her uh, ethics officer that she brought with her. And we, we talked for about an hour. It was a nice chat. Um, I want to share some things with you, though, that Blanca and myself discussed. Because I think it's going to show you just how out of touch with reality the Church of Scientology is. And then also... We have some more developing news with the Church of Scientology this week with another one of their celebrity poster children leaving the church. Leah Remney finally got out of the Church of Scientology, and one of the reasons that she got out is because of the, the craziness that goes on in the church with their auditing and their lack of human rights that they, um, they observe in the church. And if you want to know more about that, all you have to do is Google Scientology because that's what's going to show up. And you'll see that uh, one of the reasons that she got out is because they actually are major violators of human rights. So much so that the chairman of the board of the Religious Technology Center, who is David Miscavige, we talked about him a little bit last week. He's the head of the Church of Scientology. He's the man who replaced L. Ron Hubbard when L. Ron Hubbard died back in 1986. His wife has been off the radar for seven years. No one has seen Shelley Miscavige for seven years. And that's one of the reasons why Leah Remney got out, because she wanted to know where Shelley Miscavige was, and no one would answer those questions where where Shelly? No one knows. There's some theories that uh, Shelly is actually at the uh, CST, the Church of Spiritual Technology, um, and she is working on preserving the works of L. Ron Hubbard by putting them onto titanium discs in a nuclear safe vault that is stored underground. Um, it's very interesting. If you want to know more about that, just Google Shelley Miscavige. Um, I don't have a lot of time to, to go into that this week, but perhaps we'll talk about that next week. First, before we really get kicked off, I want to wish a happy birthday to my wife, who I love very much. Today is her birthday. I want to let you guys who are listening in know that if it was not for my wife, I would still be part of the Church of Scientology today uh, through a lot of prayer and conversation. Um, my wife really helped lead me out of that cult. They, uh, 
the the church actually was trying to convince me to divorce my wife. They wanted me to divorce her and join the C organization. And um, thank God I didn't do that. Thank God my wife was faithful and she she prayed for me. And it's through those prayers and through her support and a lot of research that she did into the church that my eyes were opened up to what the Church of Scientology really is. Because just being the chaplain and bookstore officer in a little mission in Cleveland, Ohio, you're not seeing the full scale of what's going on in the church universally. Um, and with all the human rights violations, we really were just a cluster of 20-some Scientologists in Northeast Ohio. And then, of course, when you go into the larger orgs, you're getting the rosy picture of the organization and uh, the chairman of the board. So you're not really seeing what Scientology is. But she did a lot of research and uh, opened my eyes. And I have to throw a shout out there to my friends in Anonymous because you guys, the work that you do to expose everything that's going on in the church, uh, the connections that you have and maintain, it was through your research um, and your willingness to put yourselves out there exposing what Scientology is led my wife to discover this information and ultimately myself. And then also I uh, want to give a plug uh, for my OSA people who are listening in, because I know you guys are listening in to the Lisa McPherson foundation. Why don't you guys go ahead and Google Lisa McPherson, anyone who's listening in and you're going to see what Scientology is all about. Um, all right. So on to the topic for today, my visit from Blanca, my OT8 friend and executive director of the Church of Scientology, Buffalo. Um, I'll just give you guys a play-by-play, -play, and then I'm going to refute some of the things that Blanca and I discussed. So I got home from work Monday night and ran over to the post office to drop some bills in the mail. And as I pulled in from the post office, a car came flying up behind me in the driveway. Now, normally I don't pay attention to things, but this car was brightly colored and it had a bunch of writing and logos on it um, for some computer business up in Buffalo. And as soon as I saw that it said uh, the, the 716 area code up there in Buffalo, I kind of suspected that I was in a bit of trouble. So I went around to the front of my house to come in the front door and a guy jumps out and hollers my name. He's like, Brent. And I turn and look, and I see this man who I've never seen before in my life. And a short little lady get out of the car and it's like, Brent! She came running over to me and gave me a big hug and said, It's so nice to meet you in person, finally. And I'm like, I have no idea who you are. And she's like, It's me, Blanca, from Buffalo. We stopped by a month ago. We weren't able to reach you. I'm so glad that we were able to catch up with you today. Now, the timing of this was too perfect. I, I tend to believe that they probably saw me leave my house, followed me to the post office, and then followed me home. If you're familiar with Scientology, you know that this is not out of the realm of possibility. Um, it was just too coordinated uh, perfectly with the time that I arrived home for them to pull up. Unless they postulated it and, who knows, threw it out there into the universe and were expecting it to happen but so i i was just in gym clothes so i told them i said let me go in and change and i said we'll actually go out for coffee now i was expecting to uh be delivered my sp declare um i assumed that they listened to my lesson one on the kingdom of the cults where we talked a little bit about how crazy l ron hubbard was but apparently Los Angeles hasn't communicated with Buffalo yet, so they don't know that I am on their SP list yet. After today, for sure, I'm fully suspecting that they will know. Um, so I came into the house, I got changed, and I took them to the mall uh, that's by my house. There's a Starbucks in there. I figured it would be safe for me to go into a uh, very public place with the Church of Scientology. I don't trust them knowing what they're capable of. And I, I recommend anyone who's listening, don't trust the Church of Scientology in your house. Don't trust them when you're by yourself. They are capable of things that you would only dream of. Um, so we went to the mall and uh, 
Now, any other time that I've been out with churches, I, I actually go out and I meet with different churches quite often. Um, they always offer to buy my coffee. So I'm actually offended that the church did not offer to buy my coffee. But I understand when you're working for $30 a week that you might not be able to afford to pick up someone's coffee tab. I actually should have offered to pick up their tab uh, for them, knowing that they don't make that much money. But anyway, I joke because we all know that the Church of Scientology wants to give out money and they don't want to receive it. Um, so we sat down and we were talking and they were telling me of all these great wins that they're having in Buffalo. And for those of you uh, in the audience who are listening that don't know what a win is, um, allow me to explain it. Whenever anything goes good in the Church of Scientology, they are saying that it's a win and it's a, something good that's happened. So it's a win for the organization. So recently the Church of Scientology was completely remodeled from top to bottom and made into what an actual ideal organization is supposed to look like. Now, when they first launched the Church of Scientology Buffalo, that was supposed to be what an ideal organization was. It was the first ideal organization in America. However, 10 years uh, or so later, now they're actually for real this time launching what an ideal organization is supposed to look like. And one thing, uh, if, if you're not familiar with Scientology, um, let me fill you in on something. Every few years, um, they relaunch books or they relaunch lectures from L. Ron Hubbard that are restored and are in the most pure form. And they do this often. What it really is is a way for them to resell you books that you already have and make more money because when L. Ron Hubbard was alive, he was such a control freak. I can't imagine stuff being published in a way that he didn't want it to be published. So as many of you cult watchers know that they are going to be launching the Golden Age of Tech 2 where all of the, the training stuff is going to be in its pure form. So what they're going to do is they're going to tell all the people who are um, trained auditors, who are trained case supervisors, who are trained in any area of the church, that all that training that you've had leading up to the release of Golden Age of Tech 2 is garbage. And you have to go back and get retrained because someone who was doing translation from transcriptions that Hubbard released messed it up. Um, we saw this when they released the Golden golden Age of Knowledge and all the other ones that they relaunched before that. My question is, if all these people who were OT before didn't wake up when they released all re-released all the OT levels, when are they going to wake up? How many times can you buy the same lie, guys? Come on, wake up. So anyway, Buffalo's all excited about all these wins that they're having. And basically... What they were here to do is not punish me, which I fully expected, but to try and get me to come back into the org. Now, I have not been to the Buffalo org since 2009. Uh, I've had no f real formal communication with Buffalo other than uh, a few letters back and forth to tell them that I'm not interested in doing services. Um, and uh, they, they, they don't get the hint. So Blanca was on a goodwill tour to visit everyone in Northeast Ohio. So my first question was, oh, are there other Scientologists in the area? To her response, yes, we have quite a few in Youngstown and Warren and Cleveland. And I said, well, with me living in Warren and being a very public figure in Warren with, within the church and being active in the community with the theater groups that I'm part of, I, I probably know these people. Who are the Scientologists in Warren? Blank look on her face. Well, I also worked downtown Youngstown um, for a company that's a government contractor. I eat lunch in downtown all the time. I, I talk to people in downtown. Who in downtown Youngstown's or in Youngstown's a Scientologist? Again, a blank look. But then they told me of a woman up in Cleveland 
that they were visiting. And her name was Sister So-and-so. And I, I questioned Sister, sister So-and-so. In the Church of Scientology, we don't say brother and sister. That's something that we say, you know, in the Christian church. But so I said, Who, who's Sister So-and-so? And they said, oh, it's Sister So-and-so. And she's a member of the Nation of Islam. Now, I think I may have talked about it last week. If I didn't, um, we're, we're going to be talking about it a little bit today and definitely next week and the week after. Scientology has partnered up with the Nation of Islam and Minister Louis Farrakhan. Now, if this is not a match made in hell, I don't know what is. Because the Nation of Islam is the most racist, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish organization out there. And then you have Scientology, who wants your money. This relationship that's been formed by the Nation of Islam and Scientology, how I see this playing out is the Nation of Islam just became the bullies and the bodyguards and the strong arm and militant wing of the Nation or of, of the Church of Scientology. This is not a good union. So the first question I asked Blanca was, oh, there are people with the Nation of Islam who have joined up with Scientology. And she actually uh, went on and told me that the Nation of Islam has been mandated by Louis Farrakhan to go in, receive Dianetics Auditor training, and to start practicing Dianetics auditing on their members. So I asked her, I said, are, are you not concerned that they are going to use um, Dianetics as black Dianetics and they're going to use it as a form of control on their people? And they told me that no, that they, they have seen major wins in the Nation of Islam and that Minister Farrakhan is working his way up the bridge and he's becoming a different person. And then they quoted me some interesting um, information from L. Ron Hubbard, and I forget exactly what the policy was that um, he, he talked about the African-American people and how beneficial Dianetics is to the African-American. And they told me that, you know, Dianetics is going to ha help these people because they're black. And black people need Dianetics more than anyone because it's going to calm them down. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of racist what you just said. And I said, aren't you worried about the violent tendencies of the Nation of Islam? And they said, well, that's what we're trying to curb is their violent tendencies. So basically what, what Scientology, they're just excited because now you have a, a pseudo-religion that is pretty big funneling money into them. And I think we're going to see that the the church is going to uh the church of scientology is going to use the nation of islam for for their dirty work um so we continued on and they were starting to get a little bit agitated by my questions about the nation of islam and uh so they they changed the subject and they were talking about the remodel of buffalo and how awesome buffalo looks and i really need to get up there and the whole time I'm thinking in my head, I, I hope you remodeled it because the last time I was out there, the walls were falling down, the carpet was coming up, there were water spots all over the ceiling, and I mean, this is supposed to be one of the gems of the Church of Scientology, and here it is, it looks like it's a run-down warehouse. Um, so, we're continuing on, and making small talk about my wife, my kids, and how they would love to meet my family, basically doing anything they can to get in the door, because what Scientology thinks right now is that my wife is keeping me back. So they're trying to get into the door because they want to handle her. And that's why every time that they've showed up at my house, they've brought an auditor with them, because they think that if they could just sit down, they're going to be able to handle my wife they're going to get her over her upsets with Scientology, and they're going to get me back in, get me on course again, and get me to spend the money that I was spending with the Church of Scientology. So after that, Blanca tells me, we are here for you, and anything that you need, we want to help you out, and we want to get you back in and get you back going up the bridge. Do you have your basics? 
And I said, yes, I have my basic books and lectures. I immediately shut them down because their next question was going to be, can we sell them to you? Well, no, I don't want to spend any money. I already own the materials. I got it off of eBay for like 35 bucks. So I shoot them down and they're like, so what is it that we have to do to get you back on course? So I sat back and at, at this moment, um, I, I felt the Holy Spirit deal with me because I've always played nice with Scientology. I didn't want to upset them. I didn't want to deal with some of the stuff that they do with the people that upset them. But I felt the Holy Spirit deal with me and say, you need to start sharing Jesus with them. And I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to share Jesus with the Church of Scientology? So I just sat there. I took a deep breath. And I said, well, to be honest with you, Blanca, I said, I do not believe in the Church of Scientology and what the Church of Scientology teaches. I'm a Christian. I'm very happy in my Christian church. Um very dedicated. I, I work there as a volunteer. Um, I run my own ministry. And I, I believe that, you know, that that is the one true way. So of course, they immediately quote me uh, the L. Ron Hubbard line where if it's true for you, it's true for you. And no matter what, we can't force you to believe what we believe. But then they do a complete 180 and say, however, I'm a Christian. It's so Blanca says that she's a Christian and the the male auditor that was with her said it's unfortunate that your church doesn't accept Scientology and that they would prevent you from learning about Scientology. And I said, "Well, actually, my church doesn't control us like that." I said, "I know there are some churches out there that control their members." Wink wink hint hint. Um, however, my church is not one of them. They would have no problem if I studied Scientology. However, if you look at the gospel and if you look at the message of Jesus and you look at the scriptures and you look at the message of L. Ron Hubbard, they are not compatible. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is the compatibility of Scientology and the fact that Scientology prides itself on being an interdenominational church that accepts all faiths, especially Christians. And that Christians can very easily practice Scientology. But it's the Christian churches and it's the other uh, religions that prevent you from practicing Scientology. That's not the case. I actually did some research um, and you can find the audio clips of this on xenu.net. Um, that's X-E-N-U dot net. Um, but I'm just going to read it to you because... I do not have an attorney who can fight the Church of Scientology currently, so I don't want to get uh, hammered for uh, stealing their confidential material. So I'll read it to you in my own voice. But here's Blanca trying to sell me this line that you can be a Christian and be a Scientologist and that she's a Christian and she's a Scientologist. Um, but I asked her, I said, do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, Blanca? I said, because that's what Jesus taught, is that he is the way it, that no man shall go to the Father except through him. And she looked at me and she goes, oh, your faith, it just lifts my spirit. She said, you have really, really impressed me. So again, changing the subject, because her being an OT8, she knows, according to the church scriptures, that the idea of Jesus and religion as a whole, but Jesus in particular, and the message of Christianity is just an implant that was put in us as a way to control us. So she's sitting there and Scientology is the only religion that I've encountered where it is okay for you to lie to make converts. And Scientology does very good at lying to make converts. They will tell you whatever you want to hear in order for you to join the church and to drop a few dollars on their courses. So I share with her that, you know, Jesus is the only way. I told her, I said, you know, when each and every one of us are born, we are born into sin nature and we have the debt of sin placed upon us and that no one can afford to pay for salvation in Christianity except for one man. And I said, that one man's name was Jesus. And Jesus came and he paid that debt, be, debt for us. He took our sin 
on himself when he died on the cross and he suffered in hell for three days to pay our debt so we wouldn't have to be there. So as a Christian, what you have to do, Blanca, is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus died for your sins. And I said, that's it. I said, it's just a little prayer that you have to say. And I said, and it's absolutely free. I said, however, in Scientology, in order to move up in spiritual knowledge and spiritual freedom or to be saved in your church, you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. I said, no amount of money is going to buy your salvation, Blanca. But a simple prayer that you say and mean in your heart, that's, that's what will buy your salvation. You can't afford the debt. No matter how many millions of dollars you've spent to become an OT8, there's no amount of money that's going to buy your spiritual freedom. At this point, they got very agitated, obviously, and changed the subject. Um, but she still tried to convince me that Christianity and Scientology are compatible. So I want to read something to you that L. Ron Hubbard said, and it's from the Assist Lecture given on the 3rd of October in 1968, and it's number 10. It's in the Confidential Class 8 series of lectures, and that's for the Class 8 auditors. And this is L. Ron Hubbard saying, um, he says, anyway, every man is then shown to have been crucified. So don't think that it's an accident that this crucifixion, they found out this applied. Somebody somewhere on this planet back about 600 BC found some pieces of R6. Now R6 is an implant. If you don't know, Google R6 implant Scientology. It'll explain a little bit about that. Um, so continuing on, and he says, and I don't know how they found it, either by watching Mad Men or something, but since that time they have used it, and it became what is known as Christianity. The man on the cross. There was no Christ, but the man on the cross is shown as every man. So, of course, each person seeing a crucified man has an immediate feeling of sympathy for this man. Therefore, you get many PCs who say they are Christ. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is the Roman Empire was prone to crucify people. See, Scientology believes that we've lived before thousands and thousands of times over and over again. So those of us that they feel lived during the time of the Roman Empire, some of us were probably crucified. So when we're being audited, that's getting pulled up in our uh, reactive mind and in our memory bank there. But they also are talking about the R6 implant. Um, so he said that there's the two reasons for that. One is the Roman Empire, which was prone to crucify. So um, a person could have been crucified. But in R6, he is shown as crucified. So in that lecture giving on the 3rd of October, 1968, Aaron Hubbard tells us that there's no such thing as Jesus. There's no such thing as Christianity. It was all made up as part of our brainwashing that only they can help us overcome. So Blanca, going through all of your OT training and your OT auditing and listening to all your OT lectures and reading all your OT lectures, how are you going to sit across the table from someone and say you're a Christian? That's a bold faced lie because you believe it's an implant. Now another lecture, um, another part of that that lecture, uh, he, he goes after the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I, I grew up Catholic. I was baptized Catholic. I was actually studying to be a Catholic priest um, at one point in my life. And so I, I look upon the Catholic Church as they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I love the new Pope. I think he's a great guy. But let's see what Scientology thinks of um, the Roman Catholic Church. Part of that same lecture, just a little bit further on, he says the entirety of Roman Catholicism, the devil, all of this sort of thing, this is all part of our R6. So again, the Roman Catholic Church is nothing but part of an implant that was put here on earth in those brainwashing stations, or not on earth, I'm sorry, uh, on the moon, I think is where they believe one of these are. These implant stations where they put these 
images in our mind to make us think that these things exist and we should follow them. So again, Christianity and Scientology do not mesh. Not only because the Bible tells us that there's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus, but because Scientology believes that Christianity and Jesus are nothing but a memory implant put in us to control us. Now, another quote, this is a little bit of a longer quote from L. Ron Hubbard. Um, it's from the Assessment Memories Ridges, Exteriorization and the Phenomena of Space given on the 27th of October in 1953. And he's talking about the universe here. And I'm going to use a word uh, that is MEST, which is actually an acronym, f which means matter, matter, energy, space, and time, M-E-S-T. Um, the MEST universe is the universe around us and everything in it. So L. Ron Hubbard is saying here, now the MEST universe is all very well, but it's all illusion. One doesn't want an illusion, so he can't have an illusion. And when he was very young, why, Christ was all right. He was very friendly, as a matter of fact, and so on. But that's mostly people, you know. They have to believe in that sort of thing. And they did once. But it requires nothing but faith. And of course, they can't have any faith anymore. And they did have hopes on that once in a while. But actually, religion doesn't lead anybody any place. In the final analysis, because you never get your wish anyway. So, of course, one can't survive on the basis of spirits and religion and so forth. So that leaves just, of course, God. And, of course, God naturally exists because there's all this space around here. And this space is obviously surviving. So, of course, it's obviously surviving. Of course, space itself is liable, liable to collapse. But the prime mover unmoved is not liable to collapse. Because he created all this, and maybe he can't either, and nobody yet has come up with as flat a can't survive as God will never again be able to create another messed universe. But if we mentioned it, brother, it would be out in the streets. So that is a fully loaded two paragraphs of what L. Ron Hubbard is saying. In one part of it, he's saying that Christ doesn't exist. Therefore, According to scripture, God can't exist because in John 1, we read that in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. That's the setup for the Trinity. In the beginning was God, God being God the Father, and the word was with God. The word made flesh, Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit. All in one, but the Trinity. So, without Christ, there is no God. Without God, there is no Christ. So, again, L. Ron Hubbard completely denounces Christianity, denounces the belief in uh, the existence of Christ as more than just something that's made up. Now, Scientology doctrine teaches that we all have the ability to become gods uh, as we go up the bridge and um, through that, we have the ability to create things and do things. And this is part of your training as a Scientologist, that you're actually believing that you yourself have the powers of God and the abilities of God, even though they don't really believe in God, with the exception of their God being Elrod Hubbard. Um, so... To answer Blanca and respond back to her and to say that she's a Christian and that Christianity is compatible and that it's the Christian church that prevents you from being a Scientologist, I would say that actually it's the beliefs in Scientology and the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard that prevent a Christian from being able to practice Scientology. Now, I'll say this. Um, I, I think Dianetics, they, they use it as a great tool to get people in. And that's how I got into it. I, uh, it was actually December of 2007 that I, I left the church. I turned my back on the church and I picked up the book Dianetics. And as I was reading 
um, the book of Dianetics. It kind of made sense to me. And they do that just enough. They give you just enough truth in order to deceive you. Now, what, what happens is, according to scripture, Satan can appear as an angel of light. And I believe that, that that's kind of what happened with Scientology is here's this, this angel of light that came around who was just putting out an alternative to psychology with Dianetics and saw he was able to make money with it. And he saw that he could go further. And how much further could he go if he created a religion based off of the pseudoscience known as Dianetics? And that's exactly what he did. He came and he took just enough of truth and he twisted it. As a matter of fact, in studying to be a Scientology minister, which was the last course that I was on in Scientology, it was a Scientology minister's course, I had to read scripture as part of my check sheet. I had to read the entire book of John in order to pass my minister's course for Scientology. And it was interesting because I was... Um, starting to get out of the church at this point, starting to question things in the church of Scientology at this point. And so when I read the book of John, I put some loaded things in my essay for my course supervisor to read. And I talked a great deal about that salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone. Yet I received a pass on that essay. And I, it was very curious to, to me on why they would do that. Now, Part of me thinks that they didn't even read it at all, like I think they do with most Scientology course essays, and they just pass you because they want to get you on to the next course and get you on to spending more money. Or that the person who was grading it really didn't understand the message that I was saying. Now, I've been on for about, let's see, 37 minutes today. Um... What I would like to do is I'm actually going to go into the uh, the chat uh, feature on this. So if you're listening via the Spreaker app or uh, the Spreaker website, you can chat. And if you have any questions or there's anything that you want to share uh, about your experience in Scientology, you could go ahead and do that uh, through the chat. Um, but, but one last thing I want, want to share before we do that is... I know that there are going to be members of the Church of Scientology listening to this. I know um, that there will be both staff and public who listen to this. And if you are listening to this, what I want to encourage you to do is don't take my word for anything that I've said here. Google it. Look it up yourself. Do some research. Look at how the church treats people. Look at their policy on disconnection. Look at their policy on what they do to people who leave the church and speak out against it. I mean, I know that when people leave religion, sometimes they have a bad taste in their mouth and they'll, they'll say negative things about the church or they'll say negative things about the religion. But you can't convince me that every single person that has left Scientology has gotten together in a little meeting to start to bring down the Church of Scientology. So research it yourself um, and, and see what the church actually stands for. Then ma make an informed decision. I, I think the church that L. Ron Hubbard originally set up, and I think uh, that, that church is long gone. I think that died with him back in 1986. And when uh, David Miscavige took over this church, it became his personal little toy and uh, his little way to abuse people. Um, so I'm going over into the chat now uh, if, if you want to do that. Also, if you want to call in, we actually have a, a great way for you to call in. If you just Google, or, uh, go into Skype and you add us, Word of Faith Radio, you can call in and you can share your experience with us that way as well. I'm actually logging into Skype right now. So if you would like to uh, do that, you can do that as well.
Okay, uh, what, one of the questions that just came in says, I would like to know more about how cult ministers are trained and what they actually do. I think it's bogus that they are trying to pass ministers as the equal of Christian ministers. And that's actually a great question. Um, it is a check sheet. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get the check sheet out and I'll actually, I'll talk about this more later next week, but I'll give you a, a brief overview of what it means to be a Scientology minister. So as a Scientology minister, one of the courses that you have to pass first, uh, the, the two prereqs are the H, H, HQS course, the Hubbard Qualified Scientologist course, and then the Volunteer Minister course. So those are the two, two prereqs in order to be a Scientology minister. And in HQS, basically you are learning, um, you're going deeper into the Success Through Communications course um, and auditing and how to handle situations. And they're basically indoctrinating you with the basic fundamentals of the Church of Scientology. And so therefore you become a qualified Scientologist at that point. Then in the Volunteer Minister book, you're going over everything that you need to know about the Church of Scientology. And it gives an overview of all the technology that the Church of Scientology has from uh, their study technology to their assist technology. Um, it, the, the volunteer minister course is basically a mashup of all the basics uh, into one large book um, where they take bits and pieces out of that. So those are the two prerequisite courses. And then to go in to be a Scientology uh, minister in the Scientology minister's course, what you do... Um, is you study different policies, uh, LRH policies in regards to Scientology. You study the Book of John. Um, you study the Scientology services, which there are three church services. There is the marriage um, ceremony in the Church of Scientology. There's the naming ceremony in the Church of Scientology, uh, which is for children. It's the equivalent of a christening um, for a child, minus all of the uh, Christian aspect of a christening, um, basically you are officially giving the name uh, to the child and uh, letting them know that they lived before and letting them know that uh, it's okay and that the people that they've chosen are going to take care of them. Um, and then the third uh, ceremony that you study is the ordination ceremony. Uh, because you will be eligible to ordain other ministers at that point. Um, and then you actually go in and you have a twin throughout this and you practice the, um, the ceremonies. And then you, uh, and I, I apologize if you hear my daughter in the background. She is joining me today and she likes to hear her dad talk. But um, she's, she's talking back to me. Um, but so what you do is you basically twin up for the last couple of weeks and then you do a final essay on what it means to be a, a Scientology minister. I'll pull the check sheet out. I have all that stuff uh, in storage in my basement, but I'll pull that out and I'll go over the check sheet or I'll scan that and I'll put that up on the Facebook page. And then to answer your question about how much time and money it takes to do the two prerequisite courses, um, it took me about a month to do each one, and the volunteer minister's course is a free free course. You just have to buy the the book, which was eighty dollars, and then um, the Hubbard Qualified Scientologist course was a I believe it was two hundred and fifty dollars when I took it. It's five hundred dollars now because they re released it, and that's one of the things that I I laughed at them about because. The day after I completed the HQS course and started my um, volunteer or my uh, Scientology minister's course, they re-released the HQS course and they told me I needed to retake it and that was $500. Um, and then the Scientology minister's course was another $500. The HQS course I got a discount on and the um, volunteer minister's handbook I got a discount on because I wasn't... Uh, IAS member and I was also a staff member so I got a little bit of a discount it was a 50% discount on those um, and then uh, 
I went on. And then um, going on to the next question, Heidi, um, as a former staff member, you're wondering if they let me before my staff contract expired. Uh, yes, I actually uh, did not officially route out of staff. There was actually a lot of um, out ethics that was going on at the Cleveland mission. And they, at the time, were under Buffalo. Um, they were one of Buffalo's missions. And Buffalo came in to uh, handle that. And through the ethics officer, he was my terminal um, that I communicated with at Buffalo. He handled my routing out, and I have not received a freeloader's bill from them. Um, if I did, it, it would only be about $1,500 it wouldn't be anything major. It's once you start getting up into the higher levels of Scientology and you leave that you are going to get a, a large freeloader's bill. Um, but thankfully, I got out and I was able to route out with too much of an issue uh, from the Church of Scientology. Let's see. Any other questions? I'm scrolling through real quick. Um, yeah, Damien, it was only the book of John that they had you read. There was no other Christian, um, uh, I take that back. I'm sorry. I actually, it was the book of John that you studied. And then there was another book on religions that you studied, uh, as part of the, the minister's handbook. And what that was, it was a, uh, a book. It was like a high school level book that gave a overview of each of the major religions throughout the world. So that was um, the the other course requirement. Yeah, blowing without routing out uh, is is a suppressive act for Sea Org. Uh, for a staff member like me at a mission, because of the stuff that was going on at the Cleveland mission, um, they felt it would be better for me for them to handle. Um, routing out for me on my behalf basically what it, i'll give you a, a quick synopsis i was going to cover this in detail next week but what happened was is they they convinced my wife to come up to the mission to do the success through communic uh success through communications course now my wife holds a bachelor's degree in communication and a master's degree in english and uh she went through the success through communications course in about an hour and the twin was the public secretary. Her twin was the public secretary for the mission in Cleveland. And um, so basically what he did, according to Scientology, was invalidated my wife's wins. And that's why she needs handled. And that's the only reason why she's upset with Scientology. And they figured that uh, if they would push the issue of me routing out, that would only further upset her. And then it would pull me back into the church. Um, let's see. Um, routing out and uh, security checks. That's a good question. Routing out basically is a form that you fill out that says that you no longer wish to be on staff. Um, and it says that any um, monies that are owed to the church that you will take care of that. Supposedly routing out is supposed to be a very easy, simple thing that, hey, I just don't want to be a member of the church anymore. You part ways, you shake hands and your friends at the end of the day. But that that is not the case. Routing out is meant to intimidate you and keep you within the church. Like I said, thankfully, I didn't have to go through that. So I can't speak to my experience for routing out because it was very easy for me. I called the ethics officer up at Buffalo. I said, hey, Ryan, I no longer want to be on staff. This is why I don't want to be on staff. And he dealt with it for me. Um, so I didn't have to do, do anything to route out. Now, security checks, I actually got to go through a security check, so I can explain that. And when I signed up to do my minister's course at Buffalo, um, every course up until my minister's course, I had done at the mission. They were qualified to give me the courses. But uh, with the minister's course, you have to do it at a class five organization. So Buffalo was the closest one for me. Uh, Sci the Scientology Church in Columbus is was in disarray and is still in disarray. So they convinced me to go up to Buffalo to do that. And uh, what happened was 
um, they came into the mission and they brought me into the auditing room. They put me on the canes and they just asked me some basic questions about my background and what my goals were in Scientology. It wasn't the, uh, the scary security checks that we read about and that we've seen them do and heard them do on other people. I, I wasn't asked if I, I was a member of the CIA. I wasn't asked if I was there to bring down Scientology. At this point, I was on staff and I was very excited about Scientology. So they were they were not going as hard on me. And once I went through that sec check, they were able to to clear me to go do services at Buffalo. Um, so, but we know that there are security checks that they will ask you everything and anything under the sun. And, and the fourth lesson on Scientology, I'm going to deal with what it's like to go through a security check um, and what the standard security checks are now that are used in the church. So I'll ask you to tune in uh, in lesson four for that. Yeah, Columbus is in major disarray right now. We were down in Columbus um, maybe two months ago, and there were maybe three staff people that I saw in the church, and there were no public to be seen. Um, let's see. I'm scrolling through the questions. Um, yes, my wife does rock. I think she's still listening in. Uh, so Heather, if you are listening in, everyone wants you to know that you rock. Uh, Heidi's question, uh, while on staff, did I experience any Sea Org missions being fired uh, into my org to deal with ex ethics trouble? Uh, we had very minimal contact with the Sea Org. The ED of uh, the Cleveland mission hates the Sea Org because they've tried to recruit her daughter since she was 12 years old. So she just wasn't going to have it. Um, occasionally they would come in like when they were doing their goodwill tours and whenever the IA IAS wanted to raise more money, we would always have to deal with the Sea Org and they would come out from Buffalo. Um, but she, she put, uh, her name is Liz Bozinski. Um, she's the executive director of the Cleveland Mission of Scientology, but she put her foot down and she wouldn't allow the Sea Org to come in. And as you know, uh, or may not know, the missions of Scientology are actually independently owned um, and they uh, are under the direction of the executive director of that particular mission. So the, um, the orgs that oversee them really don't have a lot of say, but they can, um, they can kind of, uh, cause, cause heck for you if they wanted to, but Scientology in Cleveland and Scientology in Buffalo got in a fight at some point after I left and Cleveland is no longer under Buffalo. I think they are under Cincinnati now. Uh, I asked Blanca about that and they would not give me any details other than that, uh, Liz, does not like to uh, stay put too often, and she likes to bounce around. Um, so if uh, there are no other questions, we'll probably wrap up there for the day. Um, I, I thank you guys for listening in and uh, for all your awesome questions that you've had. If uh, you have any other questions... Yeah, Cincinnati is ne nearly dead as well. No matter how much money they pump into it, they're they're not getting the public in there that they need to survive. I, I think what we're going to see pretty soon is that the only orgs that are able to maintain are the ones uh, like in New York City and in larger uh, metropolitan areas where you just have millions and millions of people who are constantly there. And what, what they survive on is the fact that they have a large staff and those staff, they have families. Um, but if you have any other questions that you would like to see uh, answered, um, you can email them to word W O F R at Brent W dot org. That's the word of faith radio email. That's W O fr at brentw.org and as i do with um one more question i'll answer that for you heidi did i deal with any public becoming disenchanted while on staff 
Yes, actually, one of the things that they had me do was go through the um, the central files in Cleveland, and I would call people who we have not seen or heard from in a while. And there was this one lady in particular who had received it was something like a uh, hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollar settlement from an accident that she was in. Um, and uh, they really wanted her to come in and do her Purif. And she came in and she paid for her Purif. And why she was there, they were trying to get this money off of her. They were trying to sign her up for courses up in Buffalo. They were trying to sign her up for courses down in Flag. And she saw through what Scientology was doing, that they were just trying to get her money. And she got very ticked off and she like blew off course from uh, the Purif. The purification rundown. Uh, sorry, sometimes I slip back in and I start using their lingo. But uh, she was blew off the purification rundown course. And I called her and her name was Chris. And I was like, Chris, we haven't seen you for a while. We're There's a new release coming out. And this is when they released the human rights video and they released the, uh, the anti-drug campaign video. And we wanted to get her in for that. And so I called her and I to tell her how excited we were about these new releases that were coming out, that she didn't want to miss this event and she would need to be there. And she just let me have it on how they were coming after her money and that's all they cared for. And if they were a true religion, that they wouldn't be worried about money. They would have been worried about her well-being and whatnot. And I couldn't, I could not agree more with her. Um, true religion and true salvation is free. And I'm going to do like I do in every broadcast, and I'm going to offer, especially for those Scientologists who are listening, because I know you guys are listening, um, since we hashtag Scientology on Twitter with this broadcast. Salvation is free, guys. You don't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. You don't have to pay millions of dollars to receive your spiritual freedom. All you have to do is say a simple prayer. That prayer is so easy. You just mean it in your heart, these words that you're saying. And as you say it, a transformation happens. The one who paid that debt for you, Jesus, comes and sets up residence in your heart. What I'd like you to do is I'm going to say the prayer. Just repeat it after me. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I admit that I'm not right with you. And I want to be right with you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. The Bible says if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's it. That's all you have to do. You say that prayer. You mean it in your heart. You're saved. No money's going to buy that. It's a heart issue. It has nothing to do with money. Now, another thing I would like to do is I'd like to pray for anyone um, out there listening who is a Scientologist, who has family in Scientology, who has friends in Scientology. Um, I'm going to pray for them. If you guys would just agree with me in prayer as I'm praying, um, pray along at home if you would like. But uh, God, I, I just thank you for those who are listening to the program now. I thank you that through the message um, that eyes are open, I pray, Lord, that the people who are still stuck within the Church of Scientology, that some way, somehow, that you would send someone across their path that would share the message with them, that they are involved in the cult and that they need to get out. Lord, I would ask that you would let the people know who are stuck in there, who have family, that are outside the church now, let them know that their family still loves them, that they care about them, that they're praying for them every day. Lord, I thank you for giving people the strength to speak out against this cult. I thank you that the people who are in there, the eyes are being opened now as we speak and pray. I pray all this in your son's name, who is stronger than any cult could ever be. Amen. Again, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We will be back next Saturday at 1030 to broadcast part three uh, of the kingdom of the cult, Scientology. 
Thanks and have a blessed day.